this has been a golden age for, for astronomy and astrophysics. Chandra's a wonderful observatory. It's very complex, and amazingly, it does exactly what it's supposed to do. Chandra has put X-ray astronomy right alongside all the other areas in astronomy uh, firmly and, and forever, and it's, that's never going to change. for engine start, zero. We have booster ignition and liftoff of Columbia, reaching new heights for women in X-ray astronomy. The real effort that led to Chandra finally being launched uh, started up again in 76. Ricardo and I wrote an unsolicited proposal to NASA to begin a study of what we called a 1.2 meter telescope. And uh, we started working with Marshall Space Flight Center uh, later in 76 or early in 77. And there really was a continuous effort to develop the technology, uh, really focusing on the mirror in the early days. And uh, it led to uh, NASA uh, eventually working Chandra up to the top of its list of priorities. I used to have, uh, in the days when we used uh, you know, uh, plastic view graphs, I used to have one in my files. I can probably find it. And it has a, a curve on it. I used to add a point every year. At that point, the launch date was, I believe, 1991. And it slipped a year per year for the next seven years. That period was very, very difficult. The interesting thing is that we didn't lose faith. We knew this was a great mission and it was going to happen. Getting any big NASA project or any big physics project going is, is not easy. Uh, it involves a lot of political hurdles because you're ultimately asking the taxpayer and your agency to support something that is quite expensive. Chandra cost in real dollars over 20 years of development a billion and a half. That's still a lot of money. Per year it wasn't a lot of money, but it's still a lot of money and you're asking the taxpayer to come up with this. And there are other missions that are scientifically interesting, that have their supporters, that may also have a very prestigious uh, backing. When you look at sustaining a development program over a 15-year mission, as well as shuttle launch calls for 15 years for missions every two or three years, uh, it was just an exorbitant amount of money. There were a number of design changes imposed by going to from the low Earth orbit, pure shuttle launch, to this very highly elliptical orbit that goes a third of the way to the moon and stays out of the radiation belts most of the time another advantage of it. Uh, the shuttle couldn't get us to that orbit, so we had to use another stage, and it turned out to be Boeing's inertial upper stage that we had ended up using. In order to get the observatory up there, we had to make it as lightweight as possible. So the redesign had to go and take a lot of weight out of that vehicle. We took off two mirror pairs. That saved a tremendous amount of weight. Then we took out all the metal that we could, and we created uh, probably the uh, biggest epoxy graphite observatory or structure that is in space today. By doing these types of things, we got it down to uh, the required weight for the IUS to be able to lift us. In hindsight, it was a very difficult thing to do, very stressful for a lot of people. But at the same time, if you stop, step back and look at it now from today's perspective, in terms of the dollars that we saved, and that we're freed up to invest in other science activities, um, I think it was a very wise choice. 
So uh, in uh, late 88, uh, the Congress decided that they would approve a first lump of funding for Chandra, and they uh, directed us to show that we could actually build a, an X-ray telescope which focused to the level of an arc second of angular resolution. And there was a lot of skepticism as to whether you could actually build a mirror that good. They gave us a set amount of money in three years to build and test uh, this uh, X-ray mirror. Uh, so we had to uh, start with the glass and then uh, the machinery to uh, polish it and measure it and uh, a test facility at Marshall Space Flight Center, the X-ray calibration facility, to actually test the X-ray performance of, of the mirror. So there was an insistence that we prove that we could build the telescopes that we thought we could build and that was a major achievement and uh, to have a senior congressional staffer flying down to Marshall Space Flight Center to witness the test of a scientific instrument that's not your typical uh, situation so that got a lot of scrutiny uh, by the way because that was successful he became a convert and so he you know was one of the people in the government who helped make it happen after the earlier successful testing at Marshall of the initial outer pair of mirrors and the redesign of the observatory that resulted in the change of orbit, the completed mirror assembly arrived in Huntsville for testing at the X-ray calibration facility. So that part of the analysis of the whole process of getting Chandra into, into orbit and understanding how it works um, involved a lot of uh, late nights. There was a 24-hour operation at Marshall, um, a lot of analysis, a lot of seat-of-the-pants work where you had to take results that have just come, uh, come in from a detector, go back to your computer, try and analyze them, understand them, what, what was happening, and then redesign a test the next day in order to uh, verify whether what you think you saw was actually correct. On August 19, 1999, after years of engineering, tests, and a successful launch, Look at that picture. Yes. Isn't that amazing? the Chandra team members gathered in the new control center at Cambridge. There was obvious and understandable excitement as the initial or first light image of Cassiopeia A emerged. I was in the room when the scientists were all jumping up and down, waving their arms. I was saying, Chandra's open for business. We got spoiled at the, with this observatory because it operates itself. The spacecraft operates so well and so smoothly and so efficiently uh, that we don't have a lot of problems. Uh, we don't go into safe mode uh, every few days, every few hours, every few months. In fact, we were wondering after early in the mission whether perhaps uh, we would ever go into safe mode because the observatory is operating so well. The reason for the observatory's smooth operation is a dedicated team of professionals that ensure that Chandra continues to exceed expectations day in, day out. And we have, I've termed it, a, the term I have for how we run things around here is it's conservatism, but it allows for innovation. So we have this philosophy of being very conservative with what we do, but we don't stifle innovation. We allow people to innovate. If they come up with a better and you know, brighter idea, we'll go ahead and look at it and put it in place if it makes sense. We communicate to the spacecraft through the deep space network. And so this control center here, um, when we have a real-time contact with Chandra uh, is connected to one of the deep space network antennas. We have uh, three passes per day of one or two hours each and our basic operations concept is that uh, once a year um, there's a call for proposals from the science community, international science community as well as here in the US. And that culminates in June with uh, more than a hundred astronomers coming from all over the world to read. We get about 800 proposals per year so uh, we sit them in 12 panel rooms and they discuss all these proposals and decide which ones get the time, which ones are the best or the most exciting or the most possible. Once we have those targets, uh, our mission planning teams, both the science teams, mission planning team and the flight mission planning team, can develop uh, long-term and then short-term schedules. And so on a weekly basis, um, a detailed schedule is developed and a set of command loads that fold in all of the engineering constraints. Can't point too near the sun, can't point too near the bright earth, and so on. And these get converted to command loads. And those command loads are uplinked um, about once, there's a one week schedule which gets uplinked about every couple of days. It's broken up into sections. Once it's uplinked to, to Chandra, Chandra operates autonomously in its orbit.